This is Space Cats Peace Turtles, the unofficial podcast for Fantasy Flight's Twilight Imperium. Episode third one first round strat G L one Z one X Mine Net. Music by Ben Prunty, featuring Matt Martins and Hunter Donaldson. sip of his coffee we're ready to go we're gonna do sitting it sitting it down and we're getting ready we're getting ready we're, we're, we're jazzing up hey welcome to space cats hey. peace turtles hey <laughs> hey hey uh let's let's talk uh i want to do a quick bookkeeping thing at the very start of this episode yeah. two days ago uh if if you were a good boy a good girl a good dog uh, you should have signed up for the Gen Con tournament. Which yes. I, one thing that I've been thinking about, uh, like when we pushed it in the episode yeah. and also like now when we're talking about it again, right. is uh, how many spots are there? Because there are 36. There are 36 spots. There's a lot of spots. I We, we are recording this before the sign-up day has started, so who knows? They might already be gone. I don't I don't know. Boy, that's about the earliest I've ever had to do a map from the future. Um, Yeah, they're already sold out. They sold out within, like, 15 minutes. That's absolutely crazy. Lots of excitement for TI4 this year. We're really excited to go. If you were not able to get a ticket because they sold out so fast, you can get generic tickets for the events. Um, they, they're just kind of catch all tickets. If you show up to one of the events, first come first serve, if there are any dropouts, you will be able to join in the tournament. So that's your last chance to be able to join the Twilight Imperium tournament is to buy some generic tickets and just show up and hope. Uh, good luck beating Jada Paik. He's probably going to be there at like 2 a.m. So we'll see how it goes. We can't wait to see everybody play T.I. Yeah, love, love to see people play T.I., and uh, real quick, I want to throw out uh, some thanks to uh, some TI listeners that played a tabletop simulator game with me. Kind of like r- like we got it together really fast, yeah, and nowhere. like it was very specifically just so I could kind of... I kind of already had the L1Z1 guide like in my head, but I kind of just wanted like another play, yeah. another time to just sit down and like, lo- like look at how it feels to like play as them. Yeah. Uh, I just want to thank uh, BNKNG, and Dragon, and Captain Crunk for playing tabletop simulator yep. with me. I am really horrible at tabletop yeah, simulator. Yeah, Hunter has to apologize for wasting your time, yeah, probably. Yeah, I, I <laughs> definitely took, like, a while for me to get used to it, and I am I get very frustrated with it. I don't like that everything is a bag, and oh, that any yeah. anything can fall into anything. At one point, my home system fell into something <laughs> somehow. It fell into, like, a unit bag. Yeah, right. And then I had no idea where it was. Yeah. And, like... I, I, you know, I just, I feel weird about Tabletop Simulator. Right, right. Well, so anyways, thank you guys for or your ability to play that game with Hunter and a couple of our other buddies is what made this guide possible today because we were like kind of struggling to get some time for a game. And so we we needed that. Yeah, um, I appreciate it. So, and, and they were, they were cool guys too. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about, I don't know, you know what we haven't done in a while, Hunter? We what? haven't just talked about what we've been playing recently and like how... How, how our games have been going. We used game. to do that all the time, right. um, but we've been so into just, like, hammering out these guides. You know what's funny is when we first started these, we said we were not going to call them guides. Oh, really? I, re- I discovered that? that recently. <laughs> but, uh, so you've been listening to, like, I listened episodes. to the X-Cha one the other day, and was they, at the start we were like, these are not guides. These are these wow. are just, and it's like, oh, Man, whoopsie we doodle. Are in, we are inconsistent. Yeah. We are um, stupid. But let's, let's talk about some games. I have been hammering away... At Ghosts of Creus recently, yeah, I complained a lot about the Winu leading up to that one because that's a tough faction to get your head wrapped around. I have been having a surprising amount of difficulty um, with Ghosts. I think you've been having more difficulty than you have with the Winu. Honestly, absolutely. I think, I think with Winu, it's goofier and more dramatic, but it still becomes pretty obvious, right? And I feel like Ghost is kind of, and this I, I want to make this as dramatic as possible. Okay, <laughs> I feel like Ghost is kind of like an Achilles heel for your style as a player. Absolutely, it's all the allure of how I like to play with none of the uh I can't I can't cash any of the checks. Right. My my right. Yeah. <laughs> like you're just... writing hot checks <laughs> yeah. goes to Creus all yeah. the time. So next week my goal is to have that guide 
for you. I call it a guide. I don't know what it's called. Um, my, they, I, they're I, called guides. Like, I, they are guides. They are guides. They I want to have been. that episode out for you, but just know it has been blood, sweat, and tears because when it comes down to it, the ghosts are not a great faction. DS Jensen, Bo Benson, Banana Fan of Faux Fence, and me, my Mo Menson, and I have been having at it on the Discord recently about ghosts. He's a big, he's a big time ghost supporter, and, uh, I, you know, I love all of his ideas, um, but it's been just so tricky to like. The thing that has been happening recently with these strategy episodes is Hunter and I have started to dial in on more what we are hoping to accomplish with them. And it is the, the number one priority with these is not giving you a cool strategy that works. These first round guides are supposed to be this is the most reliable thing we can come up with. Yeah. In the future, we're probably going to revisit a lot of these factions and like, ooh, we tried this new crazy idea and let's explain how it works to you. But these first round guides are, this is the, I, mean, I think the Muat is the best example of this, where it's like, there's right. all kinds of things you can do with Muat, but we wanted to find the, the most one conservative that, play. The one that worked consistently and didn't, you know, we're trying to find the least situational things. And when we first described ghosts, they were a situational race. And that has been really hard for me to tackle is like, how do I turn a inherently situational race into something that can become consistent? Right. And how do you, how do you create like a conservative play style for a race that is, doesn't really have any conservative mechanics. Kind of, yeah. They don't have anything with them that is just like, you can do this conservatively and, and set yourself up for a good mid game. There's so much to, built into them to encourage you, yeah. Matt, the player, Me, to yes. play as risky as possible. Right. And that's my pitfall is going too risky. That's why Sar and Isarl are good races for me because it's what I want to do and they bail me out a right, lot <laughs> right right they have they actually have something to kind of counterbalance that risk right or there's like a risk reward to it like sar you get the trade goods every time you take planets right so, right, yeah, right right expanding quickly is, get, is gives good. you something right and yeah it's crazy uh and i mean like matt i would say as a player his style is like if you have anybody in your group that really likes to suddenly throw one of their command counters down on a hex oh my gosh, that right. you didn't think they yep. could even activate. I sit, is, I sit, and I, I I put my hands together. I put my thumb under my chin, my thumbs <laughs> under my chin. I kind of I cover up my mouth. I cover up as much of my face as I can so that you can't really tell what I'm doing. I do this thing where I look at every single hex on the board. Yeah. I look I look at every single one of them because I want someone to be looking at my eyes. Like a guru. I know. I'm like, who's... They're not going to be able to track... Like, okay, I want to look at Muat's hex because that's where I'm going, but I need to throw them off the scent, so I'm just going to look at the whole board, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then, boom, there's yeah. the command counter. What are you going to do about it? Here I come. And that is a scary prospect as the ghosts in the first, like, four rounds of the game. Honestly, I... I I will say I I am probably just a less risky player in yeah. general, uh, but I do the exact same thing, especially oh, yeah. the fake out thing. Yeah. <laughs> I will come look at somebody's race sheet directly at a player's <laughs> race sheet that I am not interested in and don't care, just so I can side eye the other yeah. race sheet. Like, and and that player will be like, "Whoa, why is Hunter what looking at my? Why why does yeah. he want to know?" And I don't even care. I'm not even looking at it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but we're not talking about the ghosts today, and we're not mm -hmm. talking about even a faction that I was working on. Hunter, we're talking about the L1Z1X today. Yeah, we're the L1Z... About... You know what's funny? I have... I, I almost forgot that the L1Z1X are called the L1Z1X Mind Net. Yeah. More than any other faction. So there's the Embers of Muat. Right. right. Yeah, Lizix is the number one faction where I just forget what their whole name is. Yeah, what even... Is. What is a Mind Net? <laughs> I don't know. What well, it's funny their... because Necro took their thunder. Yeah, before like, Necro the came around, so confused. Lizix was they're the Borg. Oh man, awesome! We have the the cybernetic enhanced whatever people. But then Necro came along, and everyone's like, they're the they're these tech androids thing, and everyone kind of just forgot that the Lizix has a really awesome theme. Right. Well, let's explore it a little bit. Pull up their race sheet. I want to mm -hmm. see. I want to see some of that. Some of that boy. Let me see some of that Robo boy. Yeah. Let's see. Let's take a look at these Robo boys. These Robobs. Let you know. We're doing theme again. Oh geez. Um. We've got what? It's uh. Here's, everything well, says unknown. I mean, the, the whole thing with Lizix is they are the Lazaks, right? The Lazaks right. were pulled from 
superiority and thrown into the uh, nether reaches of space. Hunter's I mean, you're telling me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, they have come back and they're all the all the jokes about binary code and... No, but those... But, the binary, but then Necro stole Necro, those. Necro stole yeah. the... All, all their the... bits got stolen by the Necro. What do, what do the Lizix have? What do, what do they do anymore? I don't know. In do they just are... sit in the corner and are mad that Necro, their younger brother, is getting all the limelight? I feel like somebody was just like... Let's do this one again with Necro. You know, like it was just like ah, oh, I liked that one. Let's do it. Let's do let's one, do it even one more again. <laughs> one more again. The Lesix are the are the frustrated uncle that just never gets the limelight. Or just like the the I feel like the Owen Z one is like the more consistent like brother. Right. Necro is like crazy yeah. and like he's into art stuff <laughs> and like he's in a band and they're like, wow, he's really cool, but it's like, how is he gonna, you know, how's he gonna pay the bills, right? Necro and, I've got it. Yeah. The Necro virus is Owen Wilson mm-hmm. and the Lizix mind net is Luke Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone forgot about Luke Everyone Wilson even Luke existing, Wilson. but Luke Wilson was really, really good in Royal Tenenbaum. He's very talented. <laughs> Welcome to... Wow. <laughs> the yeah, only re- is, it's the only reason I did that bit. This is the first... Yeah, just, just, you <laughs> so were like, like, I'm going like, to roll oh, out wow. this carpet for oh, me man. to go, and oh, I'm just gonna wow. Say, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was the first time I think anyone's talked about Twilight Imperium and Wes Anderson in the same. In the same. In the same. You'd think it would cross over maybe yeah, a little more. A little bit more. Yeah. Wes Anderson should do a movie about board games. I think that would be. That'd be good. Intro- introduce me to the oh, L1 fine. Z1 X mine. We mind will. Net. Okay. Um, so. They have two abilities. Uh, we famously got very excited. Boy, did we about poop these two. our shorts. We literally, <laughs> what is this? Like, I think it was on episode four of the yes. show. You can hear us just being like, There's, <laughs> this is insane. <clears throat> they are the best race of all time. And I have no idea what we were talking yeah. about. They're good. They're good. They're I'm, not, I'm not saying they're bad. They are, but boy. They're cool. They're good. They're consistent. They are not like crushing the world with this right. but here are the two abilities assimilate when you gain control of a planet replace each pds and space dock that is on that planet with a matching unit from your reinforcements and then in in the case of the um space dock they get to build out yeah, of it yeah, so it is better than the winus you gain control ability. and then the next step in an activation is production so you are immediately building out of someone else's space dock this counts like on their home system. It is worth noting that technically speaking, Lizix is the best faction to take someone's home system. Right. In the late yeah. Because you're going to take it and then immediately build a bunch of ground forces or whatever you want to there. And I'm going to underline late game because I think that mm-hmm. is where, like, pe- when we got obsessed with this ability, yeah. we kind of saw it as like, this is going to have a lot of potential throughout the game. But Space Locks don't hit the board. As, out there no, very not much. as much. Not as much as in TI3, I felt like. Um, I don't think we realized when we were first analyzing this game, we didn't realize how little construction would be played. I right. still love the construction strategy card in how it introduces the PDS and space dock mechanic right. and how it changes that because I didn't like the old version mm-hmm. and this is a better fix. But it's worth noting, it is not an especially good strategy card, and it's very hard to justify and taking it. sometimes it doesn't get picked. And sometimes and it, it very often doesn't get picked. Yeah. And so um, I would love to, in an expansion, see a boost. I want to see construction the same way it is, but just better. Right. More, uh, the ability to put more stuff on the board and then maybe move them to just like in general I want to be able to do more with construction so able, that it's good you know honestly I kind of wish now because the rules have changed it would be wouldn't it be cool if there was a race that could build space docks on their own like right. that's their thing yeah. anyways that's completely Having fun there yeah <laughs> but the, the point the point though being assimilate is not that useful because PDS and space especially space docks don't hit the middle of the board that often PDS right. somewhat do but there are some problems with L1Z1X versus PDS where that's not the good part of this ability. The good part of this ability is taking a space dock from right, someone else. Right, right. And I, yeah, I just want to emphasize that. I, I do think it is a good ability, sure. but it is like a crazy, awesome, late game play. Absolutely. It isn't like a Hunter's Law thing where you get no, to use it no. frequently and all the time. The other ability, uh, which is a little more Hunter's Law, is called Harrow. After each round of ground combat, your ships in the active system may use their bombardment abilities against your opponent's ground forces on the planet. This is where we lost our minds. Right. We loved this. And this is still cool. It's still cool, but it is not as often. And there's a counter, and you don't use it nearly as often as you think you will. And, yeah. Both of these abilities, I will say, are in the just, like, those are good abilities, but they are not, like, 
amazing compared to some other factions. Right. What makes this faction good is let's talk about their start. They're yeah. starting tech, they're yes, starting units, yes. they're starting planet. Because I love everything that about is where this. this faction shines. I think it's my favorite start. I will say that. So we did we sat down with it for a few minutes and we, we kind of mathed out every single faction start. We we basically how many resources do they start with? Mm-hmm. How many resources are all their ships worth? How many resources would their all their tech be worth? And then we also gave them resources for their PDS. In TI three PDS were worth three resources, so I kind of just put that. Well, they're still the now they're worth a command counter, which, which is, three is three influence. influence. So, so whatever right, we're playing, yeah. what are we playing? Calvin. There Ball. it is. Uh, so the the thing about Lizix is when you add everything up, of course, Jolnar takes the cake because four tech is sixteen resources. There's yeah. just no way to compete with that. Right. But outside of that, Lizix is number one. Lizix adds up to twenty seven resources worth of stuff. They start with one dreadnought, one carrier three fighters, five infantry, and one PDS. I really want to, like, actually sit down. A lot of times we kind of glaze over and just talk about what the starting units are. Right, right. Let's break down why this is such a good starting Well, fleet. here's so here's a key part of, point of L1Z1, and it's actually, I think, kind of the sleeper hit of the entire race. A key, very important part of their race is that their dreadnoughts have capacity two. Mm-hmm. This is something that I think we probably, when we first looked at all the races, we were like, cool, capacity two. Right. It is it's now huge. like my favorite thing about the yeah, race. Absolutely. Um, and they start that way. You, you don't have to upgrade them um, to yeah. be that way. So what that means is that even though this isn't two carrier four I, they do satisfy the two C four I. Right. It's, they the, have five infantry. They have a carrier that can carry two, meaning it could be two infantry. Right. Um, and then they have, or they, sorry, they have the dreadnought that can carry two, and then the carrier that, of course, can carry four. They even they have more stuff than they can carry, right. which is crazy. It's so like even comparing this to, you know, we said Jolnar has the highest value of stuff, but the problem with Jolnar is they only start with the two infantry. So the one dreadnought can carry one thing. Right. The carrier can carry two. The the whole reason you want two C four I is you want to be able to take any two planet system you come up to. So the best play is send one carrier one way, one carrier the other. You get four planets out of it. Right. A normal one dreadnought, one carrier. You could only take three ground forces, which means you're only going to get three planets. Right. With Lizix, you can get four planets. It is. Exactly the same as two C four I, except for it's better because your dreadnought is better than a carrier technically. Right, of and course. The, and the other big thing within all of that is, so you start with the infantry to do all of that. Right. You have five infantry. You can put two on your dreadnought, go to that planet, take your two planets, and the other two on your carrier. Like you're getting all the same planets that you needed. You're moving everything out. You you can have the best start in the game. Mm-hmm. Because any other 2C4I race is good, but their C, yours is yours is a dreadnought. I right. mean, it's amazing. And add to that, you start with two tech. And, and also, you start with three fighters that you could just leave, like, sitting in your home system. Yep. You don't need to send them out with anybody. And then once you're building new dreadnoughts, you've already got fighters Fighter ready to go, yep. basically. Yeah. The And, yeah, the, the, two, the two capacity on your dreadnoughts is huge, too, just for, like, really good fleets because... You're sustaining damage, but you're also constant. You always have reliable fighter screens. Right. A dreadnought carrying one fighter is always kind of a weird proposition, and you don't see it done very often. Mm-hmm. But two capacity. I mean, I'm if you have that late game L one Z one dreadnought fleet, uh, you've got five dreadnoughts on the board. That's ten fighters you could be carrying. Mm-hmm. If you throw in their flagship that has a whopping five capacity, that's fifteen yeah. fighters yeah. potentially. You don't need a carrier, right? You don't need right. to waste. You never resources. need to build another carrier. The whole game, technically. Yeah, before I never we get did. before we get did. into the flagship, let's also just go over their starting tech. Yeah, it's neural motivator, which gives you an extra action card every round. Mm-hmm. And Amazing. Hey, we've had a lot of recent talk. We've on had, the Discord. Yeah, the Discord has been some talk about neural motivator. Let's go ahead and just let's throw unaligned magi a bone and say uh, neural motivator is the best tech in the game yeah we're throwing that out there you know let's, sure. let's see let's see what uh i, I just want to see what errata we just, get back from it. <laughs> because just, it's, been, it's been me and one of, it's been me and ds jensen banana fanafo fence me my moments you get it okay <laughs> it's been the two of us sort of like 
combating actually it's been me mediating the two of them arguing at each other about sarween tools versus neural motivator so let's just start that as kind of a community-wide discussion sarween versus neural motivator go all right plop, plop. So, that was us throwing that was out us our doing crossfire yeah. crossfire all right <laughs> um so the other tech they start with is plasma scoring that's what gives you an extra die on pds and yeah. bombardment which is amazing for them because that's what they do um I mean, technically speaking, giving them one extra die on bombardment is giving them two extra die on yeah. bombardment because you're doing bombardment after a round of combat. That's that's the important thing with Harrow is it happens at the end of a round of ground combat. So even if you lose your infantry in the ground combat, you do one more round of bombardment every time. Yeah. You always finish the fight. You always it's finish so, the job. You, you, you so, tear them up. It's so crazy. So now, Hunter, give us, give us the flagship. So the flagship, uh, which I think is probably my favorite flagship i think it just it's not the best flagship no, obviously we've no. covered that yeah and you guys <laughs> loved it um their flagship is called the 0. 0. 0.0.1 uh it during a space combat hits produced by this ship and by your dreadnoughts in this system must be assigned to non-fighter ships if able it has sustained damage hits two on a five movement of one capacity five yeah. i love that high capacity yeah capacity is love that it's it's really crazy especially once we stacked it up against all the other flagships i don't think it's something we even realized mm -hmm. that like oh wow it has more capacity than anything else on top of all these other benefits you're getting from it that is pretty huge i don't want to get too ahead of ourselves but i feel like the flagship is the thing that pins l1 into being like okay you really do have to do the dreadnought thing. yeah if not for right. the flagship inheritance systems which we will cover maybe we should cover it now um would kind of allow, I think, anyone to kind of theorycraft L1 in so many different ways. Right. But, like, this is the advantage the that makes it, like, you have to get those right, dreadnoughts. Right, right. Um, yeah, so let's cover their faction tech. First yeah. off is the Super Dreadnought 2 upgrade. So you already start with a 4-cost, 5-combat, 1-move, 2-capacity dreadnought. So pretty normal except for extra capacity. And this boosts it up to 4-combat. 2-movement. Two 2-move. Two Keeps the capacity at two and does the same thing as um, the other Dreadnought 2s, which is cannot be targeted by directed action cards, which many people will tell you is sort of insanely overpowered. Right. And almost any race is incentivized to upgrade their Dreadnoughts. Lizix quadruply so. I will say this. This is not, to me, a very like sexy tech. I'll say that. Yeah. And the reason that I don't think it's sexy is that I think the the really cool thing about the L1 Dreadnoughts is the two capacity, and they already start with it. Right. You're mostly upgrading just for that two movement, right. which is why everyone upgrades their Dreadnoughts. Well, and for the direct hit avoidance. I, right. Yeah, the, the truth of the matter is, yeah, the the Dreadnoughts themselves are sexy, and you want to upgrade them because you, you want to have your sexy Dreadnoughts right. be even better, just like right. everybody else's Dreadnoughts need to get even better. And yeah, can we just say, for the record... They're very sexy. So dread sexy. Sexy dreadnoughts. Sexy dreadnoughts. Uh, Hunter. Ooh la la. <laughs> let's, start, let's start the great debate. Sure. Inheritance systems Inheritance requires systems. two yellow. I'm it ready. yellow itself. You may exhaust this card and spend two resources when you research a technology. Ignore all of that technology's prerequisites. This counts for upgrades. This counts for everything. If you get inheritance systems, you can then get any tech in the game, no matter what you want to do. So It's insane. Let's break down... Um, I, I want to be the community. Okay. And I want you to then combat me on some of this. Sure. Uh, the, the prevailing thought is, oh, holy cow. This is amazing. Yep. I can get any tech in the game I want. I should rush for this, get mm -hmm. it, so that I can very quickly start getting all that late game tech. This is very similar to Jolnar. Jolnar can just by like round two have some like insane late game tech. And Lizix can basically do the exact same thing if they want to. If round one, I get two yellows, or if I have a yellow skip, I can get inheritance systems maybe round one. That would be a tricky, annoying play. But by round two, I could have inheritance systems and be ready to get anything. That is such a good proposition. Why would I ever pass that up? Uh, because it's waste. It's a it's a waste of time in the early game, which I think is a little more critical mm -hmm. uh, for L one and really, I mean, any race. Like you need your early game to go well. Yep. Um, you're you will always need your early game to go well. And technically, we're talking about researching Sarwain, Graviton, which is almost useless for you. Yep. And then also inheritance systems, which is a a useless tech in, in that itself. It, it, in itself. Yes. So Bra breaking that down. It doesn't That's give you... dead tech. Too dead got. tech. Yeah. yeah. So, then let's go the other way with it. Let's go the... Let's get Dreadnought 2 first. We're going to get Anti-Mass, which is, I mean, not super helpful, but it, it could be. It is always, in some way, useful. Right. 
Gravity Drive, which is arguably one of the most useful techs in the yep. game, if not the use- most useful right. tech in the game. Uh, let's fight. Um, Sarween, which is obviously useful. And then Dreadnought 2, which is useful. Right. So we didn't get near as much dead tech. There's only one dead tech we may have gotten. And it's not that dead. <laughs> no, and it's not that dead. So I feel like the, the logic of going for inheritance systems first is... I, I just don't... I don't see it. I, I don't see why. But... You are still suggesting get inheritance systems. Oh, I most certainly am yes. suggesting getting inheritance yeah. systems. Because I inheritance, inheritance system systems. is an amazing late game tech. It's super. There's amazing. basically there's going to be a lot of arguments with L one Z one X of like when you do what you do, and this comes back to what we were saying earlier. If we are going to today offer you up as conservative. Mm-hmm. An approach to L one Z one X as we can. There are crazy plays you can do with L one Z one X, but they will not be nearly as reliable. And yes. we want to give you what we see as the most reliable thing you can possibly do. It's worth noting, we didn't mention this yet, but they also start with a five zero home system. Five resources, zero influence. Mm-hmm. It's weird. Five resources is great. It does make it a little awkward for tech. It's a funny amount of resources on one planet because obviously when you research tech, you need four resources, which means if you flip the planet, right. you are burning a resource. Right. Or you need six resources, which is one shy. So yeah. it's like right there in the middle to make it hard to do exactly what you want with tech all the time. But I think it's time to get into let's do the real specific stuff. Um, oh, we should cover the promissory note real quick. In yeah. fact, let's get it out of the way so we don't even really have to talk about it for the rest yes. of the guide. Um, their promissory note is called Cybernetic Enhancements. At the start of your turn, remove one token from the L1Z1X player's strategy pool and return it to his reinforcements. Then place one command token from your reinforcements in your strategy pool. Then return this card to the L1Z1X player. So this is how I want every promissory note to be. Sure. To be to be honest, it's it is just a like kind of some sort of resource for some sort of resource trade. Yeah. I, I think if all promissory notes were sort of based around this, a lot of them would see more play. The problem is this one, even in itself, doesn't really see that much play. Yeah, I'll, I'll be transparent and say that, um, I you know, I always try and faithfully uh, explore every aspect of the race. Um, I could not sell cybernetic enhancements. I wanted to. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't figure it out. Um, I... Theory, this is all theory crafty for this part. Um, and guys, feel free. Every time promissory note is always the one. always part. wrong. Yeah, yeah, come come out at us if, if you've got it. But I don't have it. But what I will say is that what I tried to do was find somebody that needed a command token in yep. their strategy pool. Uh, the problem is a lot of times I either couldn't trade with that person or like yep. we couldn't find a price that seemed agreeable. Right. Like, I, I don't feel like it's worth a whole lot, but I'm not going to give it to you for nothing. Right. Like, I need You are going to take a command counter from me. Right. You're going to get one. There There's a price in there somewhere, but also the people who need this the most are usually starved in general. Like, you don't, you don't just starve in command counters, but you're just, like, wheeling and dealing in every other type of resource. Like, if you're having trouble with command counters, you're probably having trouble with something else, usually influence. Um, and and it's worth noting that the command token has to go into your strategy pool. So, like, a lot of times I could find, like, oh, like, if it was yeah. a command token you could put in your tactic pool, it would be really easy yeah. to sell it. Because be like, hey, you messed up and you need another right. action this turn. I, I can sell you this. Right. And I think that would be really useful. But it has to stay in strategy. So it's a lot. If it was tactic, I feel like you could find a spot for yeah. it. But it's kind of hard. Right. And this one is also interesting because it's not the same as um, the Federation of Souls. Which is remove one token from the strategy pool if able. And this one is return from one from the strategy pool. So, yeah. so It if, has to be there. It has to. If it's you not cannot, there, you can't use it. Right. If they do not have a strategy token, you don't get to do the ability. I mean, I'll say this. If you, if you really, really need the money and you're trying to market this thing, just tell the whole table, like, hey, if you guys need to do a secondary that, like, is, you, that, yeah. yeah, and you're like, oh, I could spare it. You know, maybe try and fetch a... Uh, honestly, here's That's the other thing, though. I don't want... If somebody is missing out on a secondary, I, I kind of them. I kind of yeah. want them to miss out right. on it. That's generally the stuff that really hurts people yeah, in the Yeah, the, the timing of it is the most awkward part of it. When do you really get money for it, and when do they use it, and, like, neither are a decent proposition for you. Again, I'm I'm throwing this out to the community. If you guys got something, if, if you have an argument, you know, you know how this Can works. Can I say, send us back... 
things that have worked though. Yeah, I don't want to hear you did like right, not a theory craft right thing. because like, we theory craft it and then try it and then it doesn't work and that's the big hang up for us on it. That's when we don't like promissory notes. It's not that we didn't try to use it. That is sometimes the case, but usually it's not that we didn't try to use it. It's that people just never took our offers. So I think what we really are asking for is maybe you have you play with that group that is that likes promissory right, notes right. more than ours seems to and so we want to hear when you have used Lizix's and promissory what the note. Uh, the economics of it was right. like yeah what did you get for it uh, yeah what yeah. did you get for it what was what was a fair price what made sense how were you able like if you were able to get a really good price for it how did you how did you negotiate that right um, and kind of when I would like to know when the timing yeah, of it all yeah, worked yeah. out because that, that's the most awkward part of it so let's let's jump into the the real talk of this Hunter. You picked L1Z1X. What kind of pie slice did you want? We're, we we do our cooperative build. You have kind of actually some options to pick from or the alternative of I got certain things in my hand. What am I trying to put in my pie slice? I mean, they're they're not super complicated. It's it's standard fare. You want I think you want uh, resources. Sure. Uh, keep an eye out for some influence, like because you you are a race that right. starts with no influence. So if if there's like if it's a choice between like oh I could get the one that has the most resources but the lowest influence, like okay maybe well maybe not. Then, yeah, I mean keep it balance yourself out. Right. Find a good slice, but don't don't, don't um, push yourself too far in one direction. Right. As far as tech skips go. Um, I think I'm I the my philosophy about tech skips in general is like early game is what I'm really thinking about right. tech skips and also for L1 this is super apparent right. once they get inheritance systems you don't have to care about tech skips at all right. because you can research whatever you want so we're talking about a yellow skip for mm-hmm. to skip graviton on your way to inheritance systems now that is not an early game thing that's going to be a mid game thing right. when we get there um, but still hugely useful still hugely useful. Uh, also, maybe there's some potential in a blue skip. Being able to skip anti-mass to get to gravity drive, which I was able to do um, in my most recent game as L1, yeah. uh, is really, really cool. And yeah. you kind of it, the options kind of open up for right. you much faster. Because then it also lets you skip to, I mean, you get gravity drive, then you skip next time to get Dreadnought 2. Right. So, you you know, you, you, you skip anti-mass twice and get where you need to go. Which, you know what's useful. crazy? Is I ended up researching anti-mass anyways. Right. Like, the, I I had an asteroid field near me. There were lots of PDS. I was like, you know, That's the it thing wouldn't about be the end of the world right. if, I, if I got this. Like, yeah. it's not horrible tech. When I skip Graviton, it's because I really need to skip Graviton. When I skip anti-mass, it's always kind of like, I mean, I could have used anti-mass. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right. We, we are in a pie slice that maybe hopefully has a yellow or a blue tech. Um, what about... Where, what are we kind of looking out for with, with our neighbors? Um, as far as neighbors go, uh, having... I mean, you you are set up to be a little more aggressive than most races, although mm-hmm. I'm I'm not going to tell you to play that super hard. Yeah. Um, but I am going to tell you to play it a little bit. I mean, I I, I did a lot of cheeky expanding yeah. uh, in my games. I was able to take equidistant planets. I was able to... There was even a game where I jumped through the gravity rift and destroyed somebody else's wow. stuff to... To take uh, a planet and I got it and it was great. I think it has a lot more to do with what races your neighbors are playing as. Maybe so, yeah. Um, if if you're playing against a race that you're going to butt up against, uh, like Muat or something like that, yeah, uh, be a little more careful. It, but uh, the weaker races, you are going to be able to expand their direction and like yeah. take things. Yeah, that, I think that's something that's worth noting is we're talking about a good faction here. Um, So when we talk about, like, bad factions, a lot of times we're like, ooh, if you can have, like, a natural border between you and your enemy, that would be really nice. I don't think Lizix is that way. Lizix, the number one thing for me with Lizix is they are one of the best factions at taking planets. We talk about Soul and and Arborek are good at holding planets. Lizix are good at just, like, I'm taking that planet for this round. Right. And it's going to be mine, and there's almost nothing you can do about it. So having stuff to take from other people is nice. Right. So get equidistant planets, have, you know things on your border that you want to get. So, Hunter, what what strategy cards do we want as the L1Z1X? So I feel like this is where I might get the most pushback for this guide, but um, I feel like because the L1 has such a good start, and we you know we opened this episode already saying that value-wise, they are second to Jolnar, and Jolnar might as well not even be on the, the list, list right. basically. Because of that high-value start, I feel like Figuring your tech out, getting your tech in order so that you can have a primarily dreadnought fleet that has a lot of options, that has the movement yeah. two, that has everything that they need. Potentially even movement three with gravity drive if you just want to send one crazy one out there. Right. Um, I want to say 
that L1 might be the only race where we where we very specifically recommend trying to get the tech strategy card and purchasing two tech. Right. Because you've got five resources on that first turn. If you can get one more, either through trade, trading even a two for one commodity, yeah. if that's what you got to do. Right. Or if some silly person gets diplomacy, uh, sure. not to say, well, maybe that's coming out a little too hard on people that pick diplomacy. Uh, I think for some groups that's not weird at all. Yeah. For some groups, diplomacy is like, why would anyone ever pick that round one? Yeah. But people do. Sure. And when they do, you can use that to you get want two that. tech round one. Definitely. Uh, I just feel like your your start is so strong that g- putting yourself in a place like okay so you start with one red and one green right yep. and we're not recommending like you go after Majin and Daxiv right. which would help you get the two tech in two different colors because those we're are going bad. right we're going for the other colors so in my opinion you want to have that those tech objectives kind of locked down as soon as possible and you need to use your opening fleet to go after control objectives right. it's so funny because you have great starting tech but then you immediately, those are not the colors no, you go for for two tech and two for. colors. Like, no. you start with the two tech in green and red that you want, and you may never get another green or red tech. You might get hyper metabolism, right. but you're not going to get the other two green techs in almost any games. And in most games, you're not getting any of the red tech unless yeah. you be, unless the late game develops into, like, all-out slaughter war that you need some I stuff. mean, if you see, like... I, I, well, we'll get to it. Sure, um, sure, sure. Uh, the other strategy card I'm going to recommend uh, is politics. Um, the reason why is I am really harping on this tech thing. Um, so I'm saying if you can't get pol- or if you can't get tech, you might as well take politics. And here's all the reasons why. You'll obviously you'll be able to take tech round two. If you take politics, you're going to end up with four action cards round one. Yeah. Uh, getting that head start on your ability to do who knows what. Right. You 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 have the room to be aggressive, and if you get some action cards that help you with that early, you can really do some damage. Right. I'm my general um, like vibe for L1 is I think that they are a great race that like has a lot of potential to do some crazy stuff round three and that's our goal. Okay, yeah. We're trying to get to round three, have a handful of awesome action cards and the tech that we need to be able to move our dreadnoughts to places where it is a problem for people. Right. So let's talk more about this tech thing then. You are saying buy two tech round one. Mm -hmm. That means you're saying. You don't have any more money for anything else because you right. have to somehow rummage up one more resource. You're not doing the secondary warfare. It doesn't sound like you're doing really any other secondaries. Right. Um, so to me, the focus here is you don't need to back up your fleet early because what you're building for is this crazy round three right. fleet. And uh, remember, round two, you are going to, like, if you expanded normally, yeah. you are going to have the money to build a fleet and also tech right. round two. Right. If we take tech, Right. We're basically not doing any secondaries. Well, we are. Diplo. No, no, we, we right. are going to have to do. Sec- We're going to have to do trade or diplo. You want to do? You want to be able to do trade or diplo? Got it. Because right. we need one resource. Right, and you are going to have to like let let's make sure that I'm like I'm. I want to be transparent with you. I don't think that taking tech is worth it unless you're going to get both of them. I see. That's really what's going to help you. Okay. Um, if you're taking tech just to get the free tech, I feel like there's better ways to do this. Yeah, because you can. Aff- well, if you take trade, you can afford tech, yeah, and then also you can stuff. spend your home system on building a fleet, right. and that is a better trade, right? So tr- yeah, there's a really good argument for taking trade, but the lure of being able to get at least one trade good and getting two tech round one is much greater, yeah, and and being able to if you didn't get tech, balance that off of getting two tech definitely round two by having speaker token is the trade off. That's why we didn't recommend trade. Right. As a number one pick, basically. Right. Um, so, okay, let's let's go the other way. If I didn't get tech, mm-hmm. I took politics. Mm-hmm. Am I doing secondaries? Am I? I'm doing the secondary attack or what? Um, I I'm gonna kind of leave that to you. Yeah. I, honestly, I I don't want to tell you to get a tech round one if you're gonna be able to definitely easily get two tech round two. Right. But if a tech objective hit, right, you probably need to. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the reason this is a, a tough question for us is because you're going to burn a resource if you do the secondary of tech. Yeah, You it's have a 5-0, and you only need to spend four resources, and you're going to spend all of your money on tech. It gets really hard to like just be like, yep, you definitely still need to get one tech. If you took politics, you're doing two tech round two, and that's nice. 
So it gets really tricky to suggest, like, doing the secondary of warfare to get a fleet that you don't necessarily need. Right. It gets really muddy. Right. I will say this. I would feel very safe taking politics if no tech objectives come out, not researching a tech, and building off of warfare. Okay. I would feel very safe in that because here's why. I will get tech round two. If two tech and two colors comes out, it kind of sucks, but I will have to get... Green the, the tech I don't want, right? But I'll still be able to. That's a VP in the pocket, sure, right there. Um, and I think really all I'm trying to say with this opening is that you have some tech needs, and they don't go along with the VPs. So I want to get them done. Yeah. I want to get them every every game I've played as L1 except for one. I was able to just pocket tech VPs, right? And and it's kind of weird, but it's because they need so much tech, and they are such a like tech slanted right. race and you start with such a good fleet you can afford to do it right a lot of other factions racing for a bunch of tech early really hinders your early game mobility yeah and they don't have that problem no you the don't. sooner you get dreadnought 2 the better set you're gonna you can be. do a standard expand uh and get tech very easily yeah and i say go for it i right. say you don't need to over expand and right. get this crazy round two slice yeah I think that getting to Dreadnought 2 by round 3, having a handful of action cards, is always going Better. to do very, very well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. We want to get... We play tech. We get anti-mass. We get gravity drive. Or, if we had a blue skip, we get gravity drive and we get Sarween tools. Mm -hmm. And then next round, we'll skip and immediately have Dread 2. Um, and, yeah. A lot of the other secondaries... Here's the thing that I like about this is sometimes um, I, I hate when our strategies are, you know, spend all your command counters, your tacticals on expanding. Right. Spend both your other command counters on doing secondaries. Like, you... you burn all of your command counters round one and round two becomes very difficult by doing this kind of all in on tech play your round two is even better set up because you're going to be able to rearrange some of those command counters you're going to basically have two more like if you're doing tech and you don't have to refresh to get one more trade good you don't need to do any secondaries right and, and don't like and don't like, let yourself not get caught in the cc economy right like prepare for that yeah like i i feel like the idea of sitting down with l1 and being like I'm going to do every single thing that I can do and spend all of the command counters yeah. and have this fleet as fast as possible. You, you, you're you going to fail somewhere. Right. You're going to fall behind in a way. I'm it, not telling you to get leadership, right. which I feel like is something we say a lot or like don't, try yeah. to not get it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just mostly because the, re I, the reason I think we come around to saying that is because we want you to figure out a way to play and score VPs and just manage your economy well enough. Yeah. To yeah. just make it work. Right. All right. So is there any reason we would not spend our money on tech? Well, so if, if we were going that politics route and we see an aggressive neighbor, if we if we have a feeling of like, I feel like I'm going to get messed with early, mm -hmm. um, maybe you do want to go ahead and get a fleet out there. What's yeah. nice about your home system is that it is worth a dreadnought and two fighters. Is You will always yeah. be able to build at least a dreadnought and two fighters. And if you see a problem, you can secondary warfare you can uh build that dreadnought in two fighters that's the only thing you're really going to do right uh you could even triple expand which i mean maybe if you if you feel like you're surrounded by resource heavy planets and you really want to take that risk you can triple expand right you could it's build dreadnought in two ground forces and then bam we took all of our neighboring systems now we're going to be slow and it's going to we're yep. probably not going to make it to that round three Super like dreads. ready to just do it yeah um, but like the, the games the, go different the ways. Hope, the hope is you now have a pretty huge economic advantage yeah. that you can maybe turn turn that around. And I'll say this: like politics, I love taking politics round one for the action card advantage. Yeah, I just can't ever find an argument against it. It's like you've got neural, you're gonna get some action cards, and you're gonna get whatever you want round two. Yep, it's great. That's a big that's a big deal. It's consistent. But let's start. Yeah, let's get into so the. So we're mid -game. we're a mid game race, is what we've kind of described. We, yep. we get this huge power by round three. What what are we using it on? It doesn't sound like we're trading ever. Yeah, they're kind of they're kind of a tough uh, they're a tough race to trade with because they they've only got two commodities, so they don't have a whole lot to bargain with. I will say this: I was able to pretty frequently uh, by like round three. Well, round three is the magic number. Yeah. I feel like for yeah. L one. Um, 
as especially if you if you're following this guide i feel like you should be really set for round three um i got a support for the throne out of somebody round three yeah and i basically got it by being in a position to strike them very very hard yeah and i just made the argument hey you can give me a support for the throne and this doesn't need to happen and oftentimes people are like people are interested in giving you a support for the throne because as l1 that means that I don't want to attack you. Right. right. I won't be attacking them. You um, can you can definitely get some support for the thrones out of people. Right. I also got people to frequently pay me to not do things. Get I think the thing that people run into with being like a threatening or like extortionist race, race is that they they don't pick their battles wisely. Yeah. You have to pick a time to be like Hey, can I have a trade good right, right now? Don't ask for, for this... too much. Right. That's Don't... the big thing is because that's when people feel really like terrorized is when you're like, when you demand the support for the throne. Yeah, like four right trade up. goods, Sean. Yeah, that's crazy. But if you're just like, give me one trade good and I'll go a different direction. Because a lot of times, and Hunter was pointing this out to me earlier, sometimes you aren't actually even planning to attack them. Right. But, but throw the threat out there. See if you can get a single trade good out of it. Right. Because any, anything is going to help. If you've got dreads that move to... By round three, you can start telling people, hey, look, look, I can go here. Yeah, not even just two. I mean, if, if it's a weakly defended thing, Gravity Drive gives you three movement drags, right. and you're right. carrying two ground forces. Exactly. You're going to take some stuff. Exactly, and that's the stuff is that you start pointing out to people like, hey, I could go here and do this, and that would be a problem for you. How about you give me a trade good and I don't, or yeah. two trade goods that I don't, right. or a promissory note of some, some sort. That's the way that you're going to be able to trade. Nobody's going to really want to trade with you because, like we said, well, for us, and anyway, it's a promissory offer. note. Yeah, you just don't have enough to offer anybody. Yeah. Like, every single time I've been, I've played L1, there were other four commodity races in there, yeah. and they just they just didn't really care to trade with me. Yeah. I, I would try to get other faction promissory notes pretty hard as L1. Any of the, yeah. any of the decent ones, I would... I almost got stymie yeah, from, that's from an Arborek player, and I, I was next to Mechatol. Right. It would have been a huge I problem. I think you can score some promissory notes pretty well with them, and... and like, I think that's how you get trade goods, too, is demand high commodity value people's trade agreements. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost them anything right away. Right. And then later, you play trade and you refresh them or whatever. Like, yeah. you, you can get a lot of money if you do it the right way. Um, all right, so not a lot of trading. We, we went really hard over the tech path. We talked about you went for Dreadnought 2 fast. You got right. Dreadnought 2 by round 3. Round 4, you're hopefully getting, what, inheritance systems. And then, where, what do we do? Okay, so this is what happens, is... After you get to Dreadnought 2, hopefully you get to Yellow Skip Graviton. I was able to do it in every game that I played, but I don't know if I was just lucky or like how often right. that would be available to you. There's only two of them, but I don't know. I was the, able to figure the, it out. The key is that you're really good at taking planets, so you right. might be able to look for the Yellow Tech planet and by round three, find it and take yes. it. Yes, so. um, that's That is very likely, especially if you get your, your Dread movement going well. After Inheritance Systems, the way that I treat tech is I look at the board, I see a use for the tech this round. How is this tech this round going to get me a point? Mm -hmm. And then I research it. Yeah. So like, and and then also keeping track of all of the possible tech objectives that are going to come out. I, I'll say this, the unit upgrade one, the stage two unit upgrade one, Inheritance Systems has that written all over yeah. it. You should go ahead, if you don't know, oh, I don't know what I want to research with Inheritance Systems this round, um... Just get a unit upgrade because yeah. if you get three, you're, you're going to get two points. And every possibly. unit upgrade is going to be pretty. I mean, you're not you're not going to get destroyer two in almost any no. case. But like cruiser two, going to be useful at some point. War fighter, sons, fighter, fighter two, two going to be useful. War Honestly, sons two, everything's going to be useful at some I, point. I think my fave. Uh, well, and we should talk about the war sun thing probably at sure, this point. We, we, um, war sun is definitely uh, an option, an attractive option. Harrow combos really well with yes, war sun you because can war sun three on a three, four on a three because you have plasma scoring. Yeah. Every single round of combat, we are not that that ability is not lost on us. Mm -hmm. What was lost on us is you end up not getting it that much faster. Right. As if you just go the route we're talking, because your dreadnoughts are so good, your flagship is so good. If you completely ignore all of that, just to rush inheritance systems, to then rush war suns, you're missing a lot of mid game potential, and the war suns may already be too slow. Right. So I think a lot of the times it's hard to recommend rushing war suns because they are always slow, and war suns are better as a late game kind of lucky gambit. Than they are as a like I spent everything I had into getting this and it's hoping that it works. We want to give you that early mid game versatility as L one and going barreling down 
for War Sun will not give you a lot of options, and you can always go War Sun Later. mid to late game. Exactly. Like you, yeah. you will always have that option. That's why it's hard to say rush for War Suns, is because it's like you can get there anyways. The reason you get War Sun as L one is to get through Planetary Shield. Right. If your neighbor is extra and they've got all the good stuff, and you right. need to take that planet, that's and and it. I kind of wish there was a cheaper way to bypass Planetary yeah. Shield, yeah. not to be so. I'm being so L1 right now that I want to mess the whole fabric right, of the game up. Right. But, like, it is a... Planetary Shield is a huge problem for you, and War Sun is a fix. It's a very expensive yes. fix. The pro- Here's the problem with it, is you have to get... You get Sarween, that's great. You have to get Graviton. You have to get Inheritance Systems. Then you get War Sun. Then you have to afford a War Sun. Right. Then you get the War Sun on the board... Then what are you supposed to get after that? And what the answer usually ends up being is, well, I do wish I had those super dreads. I can get super dreads. I do wish I had gravity drive. Right. I get gravity drive anyways. Like you end up getting all the requirements for super dreads, no matter what. So you might as well get the super dreads. You, every tech you're getting along the way to super dreads is good. And then you get inheritance, and then you get your war sons, anyways. That's the big thing, and you're going to have mid game success because people aren't going to have that many PDS down in the mid game. Right. The war sun is the late game. That one faction over there invested really heavily in PDS all game, and now I get to go deal with. And you that. do have capacity too, meaning that you can bring enough infantry to possibly get through a yep. PDS. You just got to count it up. If they, I mean, almost every race that goes PDS does happens to have plasma scoring right. as well, so it's kind of a bummer in that way, but. Like, you just count it up, and then you actually get to take that PDS if you can kind of ground force through it. It's just a shame that you don't get to use your bombardment ability as often as we all want to. Yeah, of course. So the other focus of the, like, now I have inheritance systems, what do I want to do, is I like the focus on I can do anything, and because you went for Super Dreadnoughts first and got all of that other tech, your basics, your foundation, is solid. Right. And that's why you can now get any tech that helps you immediately. Right. A lot of other factions, their late game tech is still a part of their like, oh, this is like my grounded thing that I have to do. Lizix is in this weird boat where, Hunter, you had a story of like, I had one cruiser. So it was I, able to do right. one thing. Right. So I got cruiser too because I could now get it there and it got me a VP and right. it didn't end up costing that much. Like that is a great play. You never used cruiser two again. But, like, it got you that one VP. And I only had one cruiser, right. so it was really only useful for that right. one thing. But that's the whole thing, is once you get inheritance systems in the mid-game, all late-game tech is supplemental to your needs of that round. Yeah. So, like, I found a need for, I mean, and this is probably a frequent one for people, but Light Wave Deflector. Right. I was like, oh, if I get Light Wave Deflector this round, I'm going to be able to do this. So I got I'm it. going to do it. And then I right. did it. Right. right. Yeah. You, you've built yourself up to now have the flexibility your foundation is set so well that you can make those crazy flexible decisions. Or like you're looking at a fleet and you're like, man, I need to bust that fleet open. I only have, you know, three ships that can get there. But if I throw that assault cannon down, it's going to be the thing that, 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 right. that cinches it. Exactly. So um, let's kind of dig through any of the other mid-game problems. You know, we are re- it's really important that we have this good round three. We we didn't overspend command counter. Are you ever really running out of command counters? Um, so the so in general, I think what we've tried to influence in the guide thus far is don't spend all of your command counters round one and two. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I kind of held to that just instinctually. Right. And I don't even normally play like that. When I was playing as Mua, oh my god, like it was like <laughs> I was spend it all. I was having to spend things all the time. Um, but like you're ahead, so don't don't overspend don't yeah. in command counters. Yeah. That, I think that's the big thing is because you start ahead. The tendency for some people is like, I can get so far ahead, but it's like, you don't need to. Get get your other stuff, like, you're ahead. You really aren't even plugging holes with your super dreads, right. but, like, you're setting up this, like, even stronger foundation. Again, it's all about building up the best possible foundation you can have. You, what you're turning yourself into is this unstoppable force. You are already good, and now you're turning yourself into this just thing that's, like, people start having the data debate of, like, how do we even deal with... With Lizix right. at this table. How right. are we supposed to stop them? Right. And but you're not gonna get there if you're taken out of fleet pool right. and you're not giving yourself exactly. enough command counters. So we are talking probably a mid game leadership pull at some yes, point. You're, gonna you're probably it. gonna need to take it. And also, like we said at the beginning, as far as map placement goes, your home system has no influence. Remember that you need to go yeah. for a pie slice with decent influence, right. even if you have to take a slightly less 
resource heavy yeah. slice. So real quick before we get into our kind of final late game discussion, I want to mention two points uh, that I just want to emphasize before we kind of like do conclusions. So the first thing is this, obviously with assimilate, there is some potential Mechatol stealing in L1Z1. Winu! Winu! We talked about this in the Winu episode. Right. Um, that potential is there. I feel like in my games and the strategy that I'm kind of laying out for you, I would not encourage you to be the first person to take no. Mechatol, unless you're probably not going to be challenged for it. If it's something you feel like you can sneak in, get the point, and get out. Um, because of all the reliance on dreadnoughts um and they do have capacity too which i like to say over and over i love it mm -hmm. um i don't think it is enough to ensure that you're going to get enough ground forces there however if there's been some real sloppy mechatol play <laughs> the idea of an l1 activating mechatol getting through throwing down their space dock and building a bunch of ground forces on mechatol yeah. rex that potential is there. The re the reason this strategy guide is not L1 Mechatol is because, to me, that is a situation that might may or may not happen. Right. Um, well, I think you should look for it, yeah. but it might not happen. I mean, you're maxed out at building three ground forces anyways, unless you upgrade right. your you, space Right, you dogs. can't get around that. And more importantly, like we said earlier, Lizix is good at taking but they are not great at holding, no. and Mechatol factions are ones that hold well. Right. When you take Mechatol Rex, you got to be ready to hunker down and not do anything else. Um, the thing that we're kind of about to start getting into is the reason you don't want to take Mechatol, which is Lizix is better at every other objective in the game. They're very good at secret objectives. We went through all the secret objectives and thinking about how easily uh, L1 could accomplish them. There's like three that are... are Kind of normal they're yeah. like not even hard for them there's just three that are like well okay you have just as much difficulty as anybody else right everything else is like oh yeah that's they they have an advantage there so i do want to say in looking at and, and you can do this as well and just kind of come up with your own opinion as well but um as an l1 player i feel like what i did frequently was draw secret ob secret objectives yeah, do the secondary of imperial a Ta lot take imperial too i mean you, honestly it's really nice for because you're not taking Mechatol, you are a great person to draw Imperial mm -hmm. because the board isn't threatened by you taking Imperial. Right. You get a secret out of it, which you're that should threaten the board, but yep. they won't think about it because they're not paying attention to what's in your secret hand, obviously. And yeah, so Imperial is great for you mm -hmm. as a primary, but even as a secondary, I mean, I'm already to the point where I say you should every single faction should do the secondary of imperial every single time it comes up because right. the more we play the more i see secret objectives are just the way people win the game mm -hmm. and the lizics are the are i kind of want to say the best at this right. Ysarl are also very good at secret objectives they're good because of how sneaky they are lizics is good because they have the power to back up the need of those secret objectives right so yeah do imperial a lot yeah, I mean, honestly, th this is the one point we never talk about four-player games, but like Lizix should take Imperial round one yeah. as their second strategy card. Right, I think right. a lot of the time, if you're getting, if you can get Tech and Imperial, you're gonna set yourself up for some really crazy stuff later in the game. Honestly, there was a game as L1 where I was basically just like early. I tried to get Tech as many times as possible, and then it was basically politics and Imperial. I was just trying to score right. points because I'm just saying like. They have a lot of their stuff is figured out. Like yeah. if you if you're careful with your command counters, if you play a little conservative there, you won't need to take leadership. If yep. you get some high influence planets, you'll probably be fine. Yeah. So basically, at that point, what do you need? You've got you've got great fleets. Mm -hmm. You've got the ability to control um, and steal planets from other people. Yep. Maybe not keep them, but you can take them for the VP and then get out. Right. That's why Imperial right. is a cool play yeah. for you. Almost every single action phase secret objective you're good at. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you're, yeah, they're just very... When it comes to what the game requires of a faction, Lizix is good at all of those things. Yeah. Right? There are factions that are good at stuff that don't necessarily earn you VPs. Lizix is not that. They are good at all the things that they need to be good at. Ooh, and one more thing I want to slip in before we get to, like, the, the counters and conclusions part is that um, the data for L1, I feel like is strange to me if you're listening to this episode you're probably coming out thinking like oh yeah they sent that it seems like matt and hunter really R like yeah. the l1 and i i stand by it. i think the l1 is a strong race every single game even the first game i had with yeah. them i played strong i did well i i i remember the the first game i played i lost to doug 
by literally initiative order. order. Yeah. It was like literally he was going to do something one second before I could, and right. then that's how he won. Um, that's about as close to the game as you can possibly have. I feel like the data with L1 is a little bit messy because I have seen a lot of people play L1 and get kind of caught up in spending so much money getting their fleet going that they have this awesome fleet with not enough VPs, right, really. Right, It's not good enough. You don't. This is what we were saying earlier. Don't get caught up in your aggressive capabilities. Right. You are aggressive, but you need to use that aggression on VPs, which means you need to build up the safety of that aggression. Right, right. If you just start right out the gate playing like Matt plays and you just are aggressive and you're taking every VP that comes up and then kind of expanding too thin and not getting the tech that you need, you will fall weak in the mm-hmm. mid game. Mm-hmm. But the fact is you are pretty good at secrets. You are not too bad at stage two objectives. There's a lot of things that you can do where that's what's going to win you the game. You're not going to win fast, but if you play conservatively in the first two to three rounds, it is very hard to slow you down. And I think a lot of people just try to build all their dreadnoughts and start attacking people. Right. And it doesn't get them. Right. Anywhere. And that's too that's too much money. And, and you can't win the game by just, like, blowing everybody else up. That's, that's not how it works. Right. I feel like thematically L1 is, like, the smartest aggressive race. They're the smart aggression. Yes. They've got a handful of action cards and some great tech. Man, like, Ghost is the opposite. Yeah. Let me tell you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that, that's for next week. But all right, Hunter. Let's do counters. Counters. Let's break this down in mechanically first what what are we countering ignoring all the different specific specifics of a faction if what what do we want to be fighting we very directly counter because of the flagship we counter fighter factions right. factions that specialize in having a fighter screen uh we we hurt badly yeah, yeah. Um, so nalu uh, Clan Asar want to have lots of fighters protecting their ball. Right. Muat tends to have fighters protecting their war sons, and right. that's about all that's in their fleet. So all of those things you can just snipe through. It's very similar to the x mm-hmm. with Graviton thing. Um, I'll say this with Nalu. My fear with Nalu is always Nalu like to have a border of fighters. Yes. And so getting through that is annoying. Mm-hmm. But then the problem with Nalu is when you when Nalu does need to take a planet, they have to send at least one carrier and then a bunch of fighters and you crush those fleets like nobody's business. Yeah, I mean, I think right now we're kind of just describing it in a very mechanical yes, sense. Yes. L1 is a strong enough race where game to game, they could be a counter for almost any race. Yeah. Like they have a pretty open-ended uh a, spatial capability to right. fight there's maybe one that is an exception to that sure. but let's also talk about the other possible um counters counter is soul and arborek we we're mentioning this mostly because harrow is such a great bombardment yep. strategy um with lots of dreadnoughts on the board and even the possibility of getting a mid to late war game right or war sun uh into the mix yeah uh, Soul and Arborek should be rightfully afraid of you. Now, I mean, they plop down a PDS and things are going to get a little bit slower. Yeah. Um, but there, there is a lot of potential in L1 unseating uh, a Soul Mechatol right. play if it ha- if the timing yeah. works out correctly. There, there is, there are certainly games where Lizix has been doing really good all game. Soul has been sitting on Mechatol all game, and as your late game play for Lizix. You just get the War Sons and you take Mechatol from Soul. Right. And it's you are like better than any other faction at doing that. Right. No one is can do it better than you. X eighty nine is too slow. You bombarding with but a L one could get yeah. X eighty nine. Having one War Sun in your fleet and then also four dreadnoughts, That's your awesome. dreadnoughts now get to bombard the planet as well. It's not right. that just the War Sun gets to bombard, it's the but planets lose planetary shield. So getting those war suns are good at even just unlocking the further potential of your dreadnoughts. Right, right. So you're going to crush soul. I will say this, though. Like, I think this is the only situation that we've come up with ever where I think X89 might be viable. And the reason is this. If you've got your dreadnoughts already out there mm-hmm. and you're thinking, okay, so I either do the war sun and get past the PDS or if I do X89, I can get them next round. Yeah, I mean, it's maybe something. he's going to still orbital drop. I, I think it's still weak, and I would rather have the War Suns because I can use the War Suns in other ways. I would ways. rather have the War Sun if you planned it out. But if, you, if you're if in a It's just spot, like a last minute that's thing. That's what I'm saying. Is maybe. Like that it's, yeah. it's the only I don't have play. War Suns. I can't afford to just buy a War Sun I'm and not, get it where I need exactly. it. Exactly. I don't have enough time to buy War Suns, get them to the But I have place. tech right now. I can 
get x89 and send my fleet and that's the power of inheritance systems is it it makes you so versatile that we could maybe i think this is the best argument i've ever heard for x89 everyone else has to work towards it it's still not good no i don't don't at me sure but But, okay so who counters the l1 z1 x who are we afraid of pds is so annoying yeah for l1 it's funny too because it's it's not even really a counter it's that it's just so annoying for you to have to deal with it right. doesn't hurt you that bad no no it's just very much a no yeah you can side. soak the hits like yeah. it's not like they're gonna shoot you out of the sky it's just like you want to take planets yeah and, and it's so weird that assimilate allows you to take the pds if it's like kind of hard, hard to, to get down there right sometimes. yeah yeah it's hard to get through the pds it's like your reward if you got through the pds you you get to keep I it can, buddy i can make it even more specific it's not even pds it is planetary shield right that is planetary the ability shield is a that is your problem so mentac uh we've seen a lot more mentac pds play i have i anyways. love it it's cool. Yeah. Um, extra, obviously. Yep. Duh. Uh, Jolnar. A lot of times like, they invest in a lot of PDS. Right, right. Let's make some special mention of Mentac as well. Mentel, Mentac has the double thing of they get their flagship on the board and now your dreadnoughts don't sustain. So I would say your number one fear on the map is, is Mentac. Mentac. Yeah. I agree. I completely agree. Uh, and I, I think Mentac is a scary... Mentac, I think, is meant as a general counter to all the big bad boys. Absolutely. Basically. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. otherwise, there's, like, very little in the game that really puts a stop to them. But one Mentac player on the board can really change the, the board state. And I think we should also talk about, um, and this is in a completely different category from everything else, your relationship to the Barony of Letnav. Yeah, it's funny, because Barony, uh, especially for new players... Barony stuff and Lizic stuff are the two that get confused with each other. Right. Every time I've got like a newer player picking factions, they like pick Barony thinking they were p- picking Lizics or vice versa. Um, Hunter and I even confuse the two flagships with each other right. somewhat often. Um, they are both big fleet, scary dreadnought factions. Yeah. So what is your relationship with the Barony Aletnev? Do, are- do we counter them? Uh, I don't know. Do they counter us? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Like, so there's but, there's so many get like give and takes yep. with Barony and L1. They both have uh lots of dreadnoughts. Uh, L1 comes with capacity two dreadnoughts. Okay, cool. So they can soak more hits. Oh wait, that's not true. Barony has right. non Euclidean shielding yeah. and duranium armor. <laughs> um, I will say this. Oh, I like L1 better, and this is why. Inheritance Systems allows you to get whatever gnarly tech you sure. want to get in the late game. And and you, you're you going to use that maybe to get the upper hand on Barony. Yeah. Barony is a pretty locked-in tech path. They can yeah. get a lot of tech, but it's, you kind of always know what to expect. Right. Yeah, they're, they're more predictable. Right. Um, and that's the problem. I, I will say this, though. The two of you should just not even consider clashing. Yeah, it's what's not the point? in either of your interests. If you guys are neighbors start the game with like okay how are we going to divvy up our pie slices because we mm-hmm. just need to have the conversation because fighting each other over it is fruitless you're just both you're both going to lose that's yes, the problem that's, that you will you, both if you, lose. if you go to all out war with barony you're just both going to lose so don't like don't. you're bullies pick on the yes. little guys yeah like, both if you are neighbors both of you should go opposite directions of each other i think so um if you're surrounding somebody i even see kind of a really mean <laughs> spirited thing of like hey the two of us can just like crush them if we wanted to like Mm -hmm. the two of you can bully the board you can be those those two guys in mighty ducks too yeah that just cruise (laughs) around and fight that you know you're the two goons that just really tear up the the rink yeah uh, or like your bulk and skull from uh (laughs) power rangers right yeah that was a weird pull there you go uh but but no like you need to talk to barony from the get-go because because there's no point in ever combating them. Because yeah. it will crush you both, and you two can become stronger for with having like a decent relationship with each other. There's a lot that you can accomplish together mm-hmm. that a lot of other factions do not like synergize as much as the two of you do. No, no, so not at all. Find find fun, interesting relationships with them. All right, Hunter. I think we're we're almost here. This has been quite a long guide. Where as the Lizix. Are we looking for our victory? How can we summarize the overall goals of an L1 game? So we're looking to have the tech in our back pocket, Mm -hmm. a la Jolnar. Right. Uh, We want it to be almost as automatic as it is with Jolnar. Right. Um, I know we don't start that way, but the way this guide has worked out is we want to get you on that path and we want to get you effective 
right for round three the reason we want to be effective at combat is because a lot of the secret objectives are very combat focused and you can accomplish a lot of them yes um we want to be able to get control vps off of our neighbors very sneakily right. like hey i got here and i bombarded and i took it with this right. one dread that moved three or i played an action card that allowed me to do it yeah we're looking to be smart and aggressive and very capable of taking planets for vps yes not necessarily holding them but getting them when you need them at the last minute and right. scoring at that it's, round it's literally what it feels like the the race is designed yeah. to do when we when we did our guide we called them objective focused and we said they win through control I think some of our points behind that were wrong at the time, but the gist remains the same. Right. You win by getting stuff and scoring the points and everything else coming somewhat easily for you. Right. I think they're a very good race. I think they're a little bit harder to play. I think we originally put them in like our, our top tier yeah. in the theoretical tier list. I think they are harder to play than a lot of the races that we put them with. But there's a lot of really good potential there. Yeah. The difference with them is you do have to work for your victory. Yeah. Um, Jolnar, Hakan, Sol, their victories come to them somewhat automatically. It becomes the impetus of the rest of the table to little, slow them out. A little more passively. Passively, right. sure. L1Z1X, you're not just passively winning. You have to put the work in, you have but to the find work the right is target. quite easy for yes, you. Yes, yes. You're, well, you're just designed to do you're designed the work to do effectively. It. Right. So, I mean, you have to find the right target. You have to find the right planet that you can take from somebody. I, I did a lot of, like, counting up, like, if my opponents could respond to me if I got there this round. And if they couldn't, I did Boom. it and I got the VP. Right. And then I tried to get them out. Like, I I, I really never went all-out war with somebody. I, I tried to get, you know, if I could avoid really crushing someone and instead getting their support for the throne, right. I went for that. Well, because the, the whole thing is if you built your foundation right, they're never able to turn around and crush you, so you get your point. And then you're still a dominating presence, so it is not worth it for them to be like, I'm now going to wage all-out war against the Lizards. It's like, no, that's still going to really ruin your day. Right. So you might as well just like let them have gotten that point and let bygones be bygones, because mm -hmm. you usually can't afford to fight back against the L1. Right. If, other, if you set up the way we're explaining. Right. The other thing that's really that I really love about them is because of inheritance systems, those stage two tech objectives can all just be basically tech that you very much wanted yeah you know like right. you don't have to two tech in two different color or in in all four colors for you is it's a really great. fun yeah. like objective. i'm gonna get hyper metabolism and right. i'm gonna get salt cannon i'm gonna get exactly what i yeah, want exactly, exactly what is useful yeah. i don't have to get anything i don't want right except for graviton except for graviton Jeebus. a lot of the times Jeebus. all right that's it let's let's get out of here let's try to do a quick errata hunter it won't be quick it won't be quick won't at be. all i'll see you over there yeah Hey, look, uh, we're here, and it actually is a short errata. It's going to be a short yeah, errata. It's, it's actually going to be I short. mean, it makes sense, actually. They're, they're, it was just an interview with errata. It was more like a history podcast than it was a strategy yeah. thing. We were just talking about the tournament. We're doing some errata on our last week's Gen Con tournament announcement pseudo thing, interview with Blark Knob. And yeah, it makes sense that there wasn't a ton of like back and forth discussion. I was thinking one. it'd be cool if somebody had been like written in and been like, that's not Blark Knob. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a good errata. I, mean, like, that's I don't not, believe that that's Pretty who... sure that's not him. His voice is way too good at radio to be... And that's a, the nerd. first errata we have is from a guy named Never Fool Me Ever, and he lives <laughs> on my street, and he says that that wasn't Blark Knob, and that actually it was just me doing a voice, and uh, of course the answer is, you nailed you it. You did it. You yeah. got us. You got there us. There is no Blark Knob. There is no Blark Knob. There's actually no one that listens to this show, actually. It's just... We just we write it. We make up personalities and we write in. You know, there's the, just there was a gen, we had a genuine conspiracy theory that we were Jada Pake. Are you serious? Yeah, there there was, there was a, at one point someone told me that they were actually it was it was Doug that thought that Doug Doug messaged me one time and was like, "Hey, be real with me. Are you Jada Pake?" <laughs> That's the best thing ever. That, oh, I'm so mad that we haven't done that. Yeah, actually. I know that we haven't. That we haven't Seated made a, up yeah. other... Oh, man. Someone to agree with us on the Oh, man. Oh, man. You guys...
Be careful. Or now. is this is this a red herring? Yeah, ha- has this been going for oh, months? Oh my god, yeah. the Jada Pate conspiracy. I'm just throwing this it is, off. Yeah, there's percent. gonna be people that's like, no, it's J- Jada equals Matt. Yeah. Matt equals Jada. That's my theory. Follow the red yarn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get let's get down. J to equals the- M. <laughs> M plus H equals JP. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> the true one true king that's really right. good uh jim Jada Paik is azora high <laughs> <laughs> hunter's grabbing that me new, by the ghoulies right that, now that new alt, alt shift x video yeah. <laughs> in the game of thrones books <laughs> jimbo v from the twilight imperium subreddit says uh, to share a quick story i recall playing in one of the fantasy flight ti tournaments the finals was a four-player game and if i recall correctly blark knob ended up winning with the lizix the game was particularly memorable because for me, it was when I learned about trade triangles. Looking back on it, it seems an overly simplistic concept, but before playing in that game, I had never seen it. Essentially, the three other people at the table took trade and politics in sequence, keeping speaker away from me, and cut me out of trade completely for the first three rounds. It was a brilliant play and it effectively made it a three-player game instead of a four-player game. I had not seen anything like it before then. In my home games, people were routinely let everyone trade or might make vague promises. I took the idea of the trade triangle back home and it completely changed our metagame. I want to point out how cutthroat it is. That is, is so that, mean. Yeah, that it they were a like... a four-player game. They were like, hey, Jimbo, you're dead to us. Yeah, we're going to do a trade triangle in a four-player game, but there's only one other person that here. so That's, mean. Wow. Um, for those of you who don't you know... nasty boys. <laughs> he, he kind of explained it, but a trade triangle is where the beginning of the game... So in, first off, in TI3, for those of you who never played it, you didn't have uh, trade goods like you have them in this game, meaning you don't have commodities. You had trade agreements that you would contracts. have to swap. You had contracts. Were they that you called, had to, no, they were called you agreements. You had trade con- contracts that would become agreements oh, once okay. you traded them. Yeah, so yeah. you would have to give those out to people, and then when trade got played, you would refresh basically all of your trade goods. You would receive trade goods for every contract that you had. Yeah. Um, and the play, well, everyone had two, and you couldn't trade both of yours with one other person. They had to go to two separate people. So the play was player one with speaker takes trade. Player two takes assembly or initiative, depending on whatever which gets card, you the speaker whatever token. gives you the speaker token. And the third player, it doesn't matter what they take, but when player one plays trade, the three of you trade your contracts, and then no one else is allowed to trade, because in those days person with trade was the trade czar they had to decide exactly who was and wasn't allowed to trade contracts so of course you would keep everyone else from trading and then the next round the second person the new speaker the new speaker because player two took the speaker token the new speaker takes trade and refreshes the trade goods of the two people involved in the trade contracts and once again opens up no new trade alliances and now player three takes speaker token, and then you do it again. So effectively what the trade triangle does is gives you two full rounds of three players getting lots of money and nobody else getting any at mm-hmm. all, period. Um, and yeah, it's really brutal. I mean, we talk about stuff like not wanting to trade support for the thrones for support for the thrones because like, well, you're giving away power to somebody else. Right. That's scary. The trade triangle goes double into that, and you're giving two people all this extra money, you're getting a lot too, but it's it, it could tend to be even more devastating for those other three or two, or in this case, the one the other player. One. Not, oh, I mean, that means man. for three rounds, Jimbo V received no trade goods, and the other people got about six to ten trade that's a, goods that's ahead. That's a death now. Yeah, that's yeah. A, there's that's, no way. It's devastating. Uh, I'm really excited to see what kind of stuff like this comes up in, in the Gen Con tournament and just future tournament style play. Yeah, like what when kind people of... get really cutthroat. There's, so mm-hmm. like there's the whole thing of in Tabletop Simulator, lots of people are playing now. This was the old advantage of the Gen Con tournament is there was nowhere else for people to like play with a, li- a wide group of people. And so the Gen Con tournament was like, ooh, we're going to see like all these different metas converging. And Mm -hmm. Tabletop Simulator, we've had that, but what we haven't had is cutthroat, vicious play and see what people do when, like, no, everything matters. We are all trying to win and trying to do our best. What kind of play do you see when it it really, really matters? Right. Well, um, I have a question for you, Matt, actually, because I think you know this, but I don't. Um, What listeners do we know of that are in the tournament at this point? Because that's happened now. Boy, I tell you, not that... (laughs) 
many, oh, really? very few people managed to get in. At least uh, people that are in our Discord, I should say. Mm-hmm. Who knows how many of our listeners got in? And I- I'd be excited to kind of hear everyone kind of shout out if you got a yeah yeah if you got if, a ticket. If you're in the tournament, uh, let us know. Um, but I know that Unaligned Magi got his ticket, but I know a lot of people did not. I know Jada Paik didn't. I well, know that's because. HM, oh, I'm not allowed to JP. play. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, a, a lot of people did not get it, which which stinks. But I mean, that just means there's going to be even more people we we see from and hear from, and I'm I'm excited to see uh, what kind of crazy plays come up from these these shadows in the field. Yeah, yeah, I'd uh, yeah, I, I would like to know if you're in. Uh, give us a holler. Uh, we'll talk. We'll talk about you. Yeah. So that yeah, yeah we, we maybe we'll do a profile. Yeah, we on gotta all start the, the build up <laughs> to to the storylines that we're gonna follow. It's gonna be like that Dota documentary. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next errata is a uh, from Matthew from our Facebook, uh, and he says. Are you guys planning to do some kind of Space Cats Peace Turtles tabletop simulator tournament? I I heard you say a couple times that you play online. Are you guys planning on playing with fans from the podcast? Uh, Hunter played a game recently with some fans from the podcast. I'm I very played. bad at tabletop <laughs> yeah. simulator. Uh, we talked about this in this episode, actually. But either way, uh, we play. I would love to do like a tabletop simulator tournament, especially because I love the idea of let's have like a genuinely huge tournament, right? Let's have yeah. 216 yeah, yeah. or whatever it takes to have three full rounds of play um or some sort of league we've definitely talked about trying to do league play and the easiest place to do that would be tabletop simulator because right. organizing a phys- physical space to do all these kind of tournaments would be a pretty arduous task and fun and be really super fun to do. <laughs> actually i shouldn't say that i do like event coordination for a Dude, living yeah I would yeah you, that up, you would but, love to do that um i uh i think w- our big goals right now are to get through Gen Con, uh, and we want to learn a lot from Gen Con and, and be able to work with Blark Knob on kind of the reaction to it and see how everything falls out. So I don't think you should expect any sort of tournament style stuff from us until after Gen Con. If there is anything before then, it'd be us kind of just testing the waters. Yeah. But after Gen Con, I think it's a big desire of ours. Yeah. We can't make any promises. We're not here to like have any sort of announcement. That's not even close to a, a thing yet, but... But it's something we really do want to do because we are big fans of kind of facilitating more games and getting getting more um, experience on just learning how different people play the game. Yeah, and just seeing, like, I feel like this podcast is really just an extension of a community. Absolutely. And getting to see that community all play against each other is really cool. I mean, a lot of you, like, in this part of the podcast, in the errata part, have, like, you know, these are names that we hear yeah, like a lot week week over week, and over. Yeah. yeah, I, I even even if it's not a tournament, I've wanted to do a stream where we get six primo tabletop simulator players, and Hunter and I just spectate, and we get to talk about the game God, as it happens. I, I don't even do like to play. Right. You know? I just want to comment. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to commentate for eight hours uh, on on a live game that's happening. That sounds fascinating to me, and mm-hmm. so I, I think that's the kind of stuff you might in the future expect from us. Send us ideas too for like different structures oh, and totally. things to do. Totally. I think in general, that's something the community is going to start looking for. After this Gen Con tournament, we're going to see kind of how TI4 specifically feels in a tournament environment, and we're going to start to come up with the best ways to organize league and tournament play because it is something that a lot of people want, and I think it just has to have an organized format. Yeah. Uh, there, there can't. There's too many house rules and too many weird variants. We as a community have to come together and agree, like, what is the best drafting method? What is the best, you know... Way to keep Jolnar from being in every single game ever. What are, you know, all these sorts of considerations. I think we are going to learn a lot. I think the entire community is going to learn a lot from the Gen Con tournament. I think we are all kind of looking to Daddy yeah. Blark Knob, to <laughs> Knob Daddy, to... <laughs> Do not call him my Knob Daddy. <laughs> I'm looking to Knob Daddy to kind of just lay the groundwork down there, you know, yeah. and see how things go from there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that's it. We'll wrap it up there. Uh, I'm going to f- burn through this rundown. Please follow us on Space Cats Pod on Twitter. Uh, you can find us Space Cats Peace Turtles on Facebook. We're also posting every single week on Twilight Imperium subreddit. That's where you can find discussions about this episode and all previous episodes. You can find our Board Game Geek Guild for some discussion. We also have a calendar that has so far been accurate. We'll see how long that lasts. It's been lasts. accurate for a minute. It's been accurate for one week. Um, you can also email us, spacecatspeaceturtles at gmail.com. That's where we want to get uh, your This Imperium Life submissions and Play of the Week submissions. Uh, we haven't done a This Imperium Life 
in a while. We've been really trying to like knock these guides out, but you can expect of this Imperium life probably very, very shortly after we finish these first round guides. We've, yeah. we've been collecting stories for a while. We have a big backlog. Uh, I might as well even start putting that call out. We say this at the end of the episode, but we haven't done like a real like, hey, send us stories for this Imperium life. Especially, I think something we've started to notice is we've gotten so many stories about that end game game winning play. And the ones we've had the most fun with are the ones where it's just like, no, 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 this was just a crazy turn three play. Don't forget about those stories. Yeah, don't forget about all the stuff that happens in the in the middle, in the middle and right. at the beginning it, of a you, game. You event. are allowed to ignore the context of who ended up winning the game for a play of the week and for a this Imperium line. Yeah, totally. We want to just know the crazy interactions the that happen. Yeah, exactly. The nugget. Yeah, exactly. What's the nugget? Send your nugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can go to our, pa- uh, our Patreon, Space Cats, Peace Turtles, to contribute. You'll help make this podcast better uh and on our discord is where you get some of those patreon benefits like engaging in discussion about future episodes voting on upcoming episodes things like that our discord rules it really is awesome and it's it's just a fun place in general even when you're not doing patreon related stuff like there's just meme town is always yeah such a good place just good folks yeah uh please rate us on itunes and apple podcasts and any other podcast app it uh keeps visibility up for twilight imperium and for us and helps kind of spread the word yeah it's like we're trying to get tim cook to listen <laughs> <laughs> hunter who do we want to thank this week um i want to thank here's the patreoners i want to thank representative no big deal man <laughs> norman ma and deep priest salt and sea yeah thank yeah. you guys also i'd like to thank um hunter and matt aka oh, yeah. john, john Pake. oh sure of course uh hunter also you've got some shows coming up uh, I have a show coming up okay. that I want to push. Uh, that's going to happen uh, this week, so it, it's short notice, and it's it's just in Portland. I want to get a little bit better at. Uh, I made a little channel in the Discord for me to just shamelessly push my own sure. comedy stuff. Uh, obviously, none of it is Twilight Imperium themed, but if you're interested, um, there is a show that I run uh, that is a brunch show that happens one Saturday out of the month at a at a bar in Portland, Oregon, uh, called The Lamp. Um, it is a brunch show, really cool, very chill. Um, it's going to be on May 12th, uh, starts at noon. It's called Yolks and Jokes, um, and it's a show that I run and produce with a friend of mine named Jake Silberman, but instead this uh, month he is out of town, and I will be uh, doing the show with a very popular Portland comedian whose name is Milan Patel. Um, last year he was awarded second funniest comedian in portland by our uh the one of our publications which yeah if people don't aren't from portland that's a big thing i mean yeah, yeah. there's a lot of comedians that's not like second out of 10 that's second out of yeah there's a hundreds. we have like a hundred yeah. comedians here at least yeah. um and yeah he's a, he's very very funny i'm all right whatever come out <laughs> i'll but if, if you're fr- i'll say this actually here i'll put this out there Ooh. um if you Come out to the show and you let me know that you're a Space Cats fan. I will buy you a mimosa. Uh, but yeah, no, come on, make me regret it. Ten of you come out and that's ten mimosas I gotta buy. And I will, I will. All right, let's do a play of the week. This one is by the playmaker, Unaligned Magi, Grand Grand Nagus, Unaligned Magi. Grand Nagus? Uh, that's his title. That's his Patreon oh, okay. title. He, uh, man, he plays <laughs> way too many games. And really, it just comes down to when you play like 10 games a week, one of them's bound to have a good moment in it, right? Yeah. He- so <laughs> here's Unaligned Magi's play of the week. He's evolving. <laughs> and, and as, such a, as a Twilight Imperium robot, he's evolving at such a speed. <laughs> if singularity Unaligned Magi, is nigh. <laughs> if Unaligned Magi wins the, the tournament, it will be like, it, we will be able to say that, well... Twilight Imperium is like anything else. If you play it every day, you get very You're good at get it. You're going to get good at he, it. He's trying to confirm the Malcolm Gladwell like <laughs> theory. Practice a thousand, or yeah, a 10,000. Yeah, yeah, 10,000 hours. He's yeah. trying to do the 10,000 hours of Twilight Imperium so he will be a grandmaster. There you go. I love it. Uh, the Grand Nagus. All right, so <laughs> Paul, the, the background of this game is Paul's been playing, uh, and it's a crazy final round. He's Isarl. He was in the lead, but he lost a planet in his home system, and he's since then been kind of luring all of the players into fighting against each other for the rest of the round. You know, doing the thing of, like, Sar looks like they're about to win. We got to team right, up on Sar right, now. Like, right. I'm out of the question. My home system is gone. I'm not going to win. Uh, and so it's leaving him out of consideration. And, and all he needs to do, though, is reclaim his home planet and qualify for a secret objective before the end of the round. And he's Isarl. So... I successfully stall for eight turns. 
Refusing the to, end. <laughs> yeah, right. That, then you win the game that way. Uh, refusing to play leadership so that everyone else has to pass, which is I love the fact that you would end with leadership and like you get to just like, oh, no one's getting command tokens this round. That right. sounds great. Uh, now is the only chance I will get. The only thing I have left is my flagship, three dreadnoughts, and three infantry. Two of these dreadnoughts must go next to anomalies for the secret objective, and I do that, leaving me with one flagship and a dreadnought to go against the three barony dreadnoughts that are all sustained and don't have duranium armor. So they're all one hit away. They're, they're right. barely dreadnoughts anymore. I play focused research and get plasma scoring to give me an extra die for my two PDS on my other homeworld, as well as good bombardment for the ground battle. Sar then says this. Okay, so, like, don't forget that Intellectual Revolution is in play, dude. So, like, you have to destroy a ship for that research. Doink. But doink, doink. <laughs> okay, uh, I notice in horror that he is right, and I must remove my last dreadnought, leaving my flagship to go in by itself. I activate my home, sending it with three infantry against the three dreads. Again, uns- or fully sustained dreads. They are, they are almost dead, on the brink. Yeah. I loudly ask the dice gods for at least two hits. I roll three PDS dice, hitting on sevens, and I get two hits. Wow. One dreadnought left. I ask the dice gods again for at least one hit. The flagship is sustained, but it takes out the third dread. I land three infantry twos against Barony's two infantry. Regretting losing the bombardment rolls and having wasted fire team previously when I was invaded, so Barony rolls two hits on the very first roll. One more time, I ask the dice gods. Lady Luck. Lady Luck for one final blessing, and I get a seven, an eight, and a nine. Three hits, my sole surviving infantry takes my home planet back, and I pass to immediately win the game. My favorite part about that play of the week is that everyone else at that table is just sitting there not playing. Yeah, right. right. That they all are like, uh, all right, so I'm going to do this now, and then I'm going to do this, and uh, let's see if I get it. And they're just like, oh, okay. Cool, I hope that this doesn't just end everything for me right now. (laughs) Yeah, like that, anytime we get, we've got a couple stories now about Isarl pulling some sort of crazy, like, stall out. There are four people at the table going, okay. Okay, Mm -hmm. cool. All right, oh, and then, sucks. no, wait, I'm going to do this now. Okay. And everyone's just like, okay, yeah, well, sure. I'm not really, I'm literally just waiting to lose. I'm going to go to the bathroom, <laughs> so you win, and I'll come back, and that'll be fun. All right. My favorite thing about that race, that is the funniest ability. Just nobody for, gets to do anything. For a race to, to just be like, all right, well, now I just get to play solo. <laughs> Playing yeah. against the computer. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next week. Oh, okay. What? Okay. You want to go out with big, a bigger bang? Uh, yeah. and, and here we go, Hunter's big grand exit from the podcast episode, Fart. <laughs> thank you for listening to Space Cat's Peace Turtles. And thanks to Ben Prunty for the use of his music. You can find more at benpruntymusic.com and benprunty.bandcamp.com. Pax Magnifica. Bellum gloriosum. I just felt like you kind of pulled the rug out, rug out from underneath. End, I, I didn't know to get that. It to end. Yeah, I just didn't know. Well, I didn't want it to end. You know, I have a lot of fun doing this. So <laughs> this is the best part of my week. <laughs> and I just feel like sometimes you just take it from me a little bit. You I had a whole episode today. This was all your episode. Was it the Lizix episode? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot what that's what it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah I had a good day. <laughs> <laughs>